Hey everybody, welcome to today's uh, Kubernetes Masterclass. Really glad to have you all uh, join us. We're, we're just getting started, so I just want to wait uh, a couple moments for people to uh, join the line. Uh, so while we're waiting, uh, I want you all to know that this session is being recorded uh, and we will have the recording and the slides for you all uh, in your inbox. So look for that. We will, we will email it to everybody and we'll post this on YouTube as well so you won't miss anything. We have about 75 minutes uh, scheduled. So if we um, run long or you have to drop, don't worry. You, you won't miss anything. Uh, as I said, this is being recorded. Uh, so we'll send it out to you after. There's a lot to go through, so uh, let's go ahead and, and jump on in. We're going to be talking about pod security policies today. Uh, as a way of introduction, uh, my name is Matthew Shear. I'm a marketing manager here at Rancher. I host uh, these trainings and many others. We do almost a training a day, midweek, every week. So uh, look for that, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. You can also reach me on the Rancher user Slack. I'm just at Matthew, and I put my email here as well, Matthew at Rancher.com, and sort of use me as a a uh, point of reference, a uh, point uh, contact uh, at Rancher if you need a resource, if you're looking for, uh, if you have a question uh, or, or anything, just uh, reach out to me. I'm happy to, to help out. Uh, but the men who are really going to be doing the heavy lifting on the line today are uh, Pavin and um, Alvaro. Uh, are you guys there? Yes. Yes, we are. All right. Great. Well, these, these guys are from uh, Sysdig. They'll, they'll introduce themselves a little bit more uh as as they go along but um they have done a, a ton of work on pod security policy i'm really happy to have them here with us today uh and they also wrote a, a blog uh, for rancher uh that just got posted last week uh that i've linked to here uh, and there's another one coming out so this is part one enhancing kubernetes security with pod security policies and, and part two will be coming out uh, most likely this week uh, so if you learn better through reading then definitely check that out uh, as I said, this PowerPoint slide uh, will be sent to you, so you'll be able to get that link uh, in, in, the, in the deck. Uh, just a couple other housekeeping items before we dive right in. As I said, this is about uh, 45 minutes to 75 minutes. just depends on how many questions we have. Please, please put your questions into the chat. We want to be as responsive uh, to you all and what you want to learn today as possible. Uh, we'll, we have uh, quite a bit of dedicated time at the end for Q&A. Uh, so go ahead and put your questions into the chat now. Um, I'll answer them to the best of my ability um, as uh, Pavin and Alvaro go through uh, their, their slides and their demo. Uh, we'll also answer the questions aloud for everyone, uh, but if for whatever reason you want yours to be private, just uh, mark it so. Uh, otherwise, we'll answer it aloud uh, for everybody's benefit. And as I said, the session is being recorded. We put all of our training videos uh, on YouTube. Uh, so we have a ton of stuff, uh, so please check that out. Uh, you don't have to miss anything. Uh, and as I said, uh, this is uh, you can reach me on Slack. You can reach many other uh, Rancher users on our, our free user Slack. Uh, it's totally free, slack.rancher.io. Um, you, you can join the uh, Pound Masterclass channel uh, if you uh, want to find out news uh, and upcoming um, online events. Um, or there are just a ton of other channels on uh, many other Kubernetes uh, uh, topics. Uh, and lastly, there are a lot of upcoming uh, classes, intro and advanced. So if you're new to Kubernetes, if you're new to Rancher, I highly recommend joining our uh, Thursday class, uh, intro to Kubernetes and Rancher online training. Uh, it'll, it will go over Kubernetes concepts, Kubernetes architecture, uh, and then we'll talk about you know, how Rancher Server uh, can help you uh, take it to your Kubernetes into production. Uh, and then next week, we're going to be talking about persistent storage with, with Kubernetes. Persistent storage is just a common challenge so many people have, and it's a very complex topic. So we'll start uh, with uh, Masterclass there. Um, and we have many other, many other classes. So uh, today we'll really be focusing on pod security policies, but if you do have a question about, you know, just Kubernetes components, Kubernetes architecture, you know, don't hesitate to ask. You know, we might direct you to one of those upcoming classes, but we'll do our best uh, to answer the question as well. So now that all of that is out of the way, I can get to the really exciting stuff and the reason you're here. So I'm going to pass this presentation over to um, Alvaro, uh, who will get us going. So Alvaro, I'm going to make you the presenter.
Okay, ready? And I see okay. I see you your desktop see now. Screen, right? yep. I see your slides. You're good to go. Okay, perfect. So Pavel will do the introduction of the slides. So Pavel, you ready? Yes, perfect. Thank you, everybody, and, and welcome to this series on Kubernetes security. It's a three-part series that Sysdig and Rancher are doing. The first webinar on this topic is around prevention in Kubernetes and how you can use pod security policies to implement the best security posture in your clusters. Next slide. And just to introduce ourselves, I'll go first and Alvaro will uh, continue shortly. Uh, my name is Pavan Shankar. I'm currently in uh, product marketing here at Sysdig, responsible for our container security product. Spent about seven to eight years in as a solutions engineer, as a product manager at Cisco on the networking and security side. And the last couple of years have been on the cloud security front as well as on the container security here at Sysdig. Okay, yeah, and I am Alvaro. I'm a solutions engineer at Sysdig. And before that, I was working like for 11 years uh, on an uh, Internet of Things and financial microtransactions company. And then I moved to Adidas for a couple of years. And uh, the most of those last two years were related to Kubernetes and security. Great. Okay, so the agenda. So today's discussion will cover uh, a couple of key topics. So we'll first introduce what pod security policies are, go over some basic concepts, uh, and see why it's important for you to enable them in your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we'll do a quick demo on seeing what happens when you don't have a PSP. You know, what, how, how a potential user or attacker can get root access to your pods. Then we'll go through an example of a basic PSP, how you can enable them in the Rancher UI and uh, what you can do uh, with those controls. Uh, then we'll shift gears and talk about more real life examples of how you can link our, uh, specific permissions using RBAC for uh, your PSPs and go through a full demo with the RBAC uh, permissions. And finally, uh, talk about how you can simplify pod security policy adoption in production using uh, tools like Rancher and Cystic. And cover some advanced details, and conclude, and leave some time open for Q&A to answer your most important questions. Great. So now we'll talk a little bit about PSP introduction and go over some basic concepts. Okay, so starting with what a uh, pod security policy is, uh, a PSP is essentially a cluster level resource and you can use it to control a specific sensitive aspects of that pod spec when it comes to security. Uh, you can use it to define you know, a set of conditions and restrict specific access. Uh, and, and essentially a pod must follow that set of capabilities and requirements specified by that PSP in order to even run on that cluster. So you can think about it as a prevention because before the pod is even scheduled by that replica set, it needs to meet those conditions in order to be able to run and deploy on that cluster. So how do typically DevOps teams and uh, cluster operators use pod security policies today uh, is to basically use it as a, a security and threat prevention mechanism. So maybe I wanna make sure you know, my developers or uh, DevOps teams are not spawning privileged pods that can essentially give root access and allow malicious actors to uh, exec into a pod, break out of container, access other nodes and services. So I wanna make sure that that's restricted. Uh, or specifically saying uh, these web application front end pods must only have a read only root file system access. Uh, or making sure that you can't execute as root user onto a pod. Essentially get, providing these uh, controls are examples of how a pod security policy can help you harden that Kubernetes cluster, uh, your Kubernetes security uh, of your clusters. Now, uh, how do you implement uh, PSPs today? Uh, and essentially that's done uh, via a admissions controller in Kubernetes. So to enable the PSP in your cluster, you, you just need to make sure that that pod security policy is included in the enable admissions plugins list that's passed uh, as a parameter to your Kubernetes API configuration. And don't worry, we'll cover admissions controllers and some of these concepts in more detail, uh, but this is how you can get started uh, with a PSP. Now, uh, a lot of cloud providers, uh, as well as Rancher, offer managed Kubernetes clusters and, and provide a nice UI around uh, applying and enabling a pod security policy. Now, as we uh, said earlier, PSPs are a uh, a cluster-wide resource, so they don't belong to a specific namespace or 
have any you know workload dependencies uh, so you have to enable them uh, and link them via RBAC uh, you know with the specific service accounts uh, declared by those pods so RBAC is a, essentially is a uh, must uh, essential requirement when you need to link a PSP uh, to a service account that's declared by that pod now um, you know, many people are, when they start start thinking about pod security policies, really wonder, you know, do I actually need uh, PSPs in my uh, production environments? And the answer is an absolute yes. The reason being that pod security policies provide, you know, a native control mechanism to prevent prevent these threats that doesn't Im uh, impact uh, the performance. So, you know, making sure that uh, it, you have that those controls implemented. Uh, if if you don't, then a potential Kubernetes user or a service account can, you know, spawn overprivileged pods. And this is how a malicious actor uh, can, uh, you know, exec into a pod, escalate privileges, break out of that uh, container, and access other pods or services. So without uh, this mechanism to restrict that pod spec uh, privileges, uh, essentially this attacker can do anything that a Docker command could, you know, run a privilege container use specific node resources and so on. Uh, and uh, we have a practical example here that uh, essentially Alvaro will show you in a second how a user uh, can uh, run the script and get root access uh, to the Kubernetes node. Yeah, so you can click the script in the link provided in the previous um, slide, but we are going to demo in real how we can do this. So the idea is we have a cluster where PSPs are not enabled yet, and we can deploy a pod that have uh, had some privileges. For example, this pod we are asking for privilege, and also it will share the uh, host namespace for process IDs and the host network namespace. So let's deploy this pod and see what can we do. We create a pod, but we apply the deployment and we wait for a few seconds until the pod is created and running. Okay, we have the pod running. So now we can just attach to this pod. Okay, so we are running root inside a privileged pod. Uh, we are still inside a container. So what is bad from here? For example, if we run a PS, we can see all the processes from the host uh, where the pod is running. So we are testing the namespace, the process ID's namespace of the host. Or for example, we are also sharing the network namespace. But what's even worse, we can run a privileged command like ns enter, and we can enter the mount namespace of the host. What does it mean? Right now, I am root in the host where the pod is running, and I can run commands like docker ps and do anything to the containers that are running in this host. So as you can see, this is uh, really dangerous, right? Okay. So you have seen this demo, you have seen how easy it is to gain full control of the host where the pod is running if PSPs are not enabled. Now Paven will continue explaining some basic concepts about PSPs. So Paven, thank you. Great. And as you just saw, folks, you know, it was pretty easy to get access, uh, access to the node as, as root privileges. And essentially, you know, what, as you can see, Kubernetes is a very dynamic environment and it's a, it's a, it has strong capabilities, uh, but it isn't secure by default. So leveraging these powerful controls uh, allows you to harden that Kubernetes security posture. So you can actually use it for you know, faster application delivery, but still maintaining the security posture of the environment. And understanding and implementing these PSPs in your cluster helps you follow a golden principle of what we call least privilege. Right? Essentially, uh, everybody's familiar with the least privilege, but in a Kubernetes environment, you know, if a workload doesn't have a very strong reason to run as additional privileges, then it should essentially not have them. And PSPs helps you enable that least privilege concept uh, by applying fine-grained controls of what does a workload require in order to run on that environment. So whether it's a restrictive PSP that you enable by default, uh, and then only allows additional permissions for those privileged workloads uh, that uh, you know that should run in your uh, cluster. But by following this concept, you can safely implement PSPs 
uh, and ensure that no Kubernetes pod or workload has unwanted permissions. Now, beyond just the philosophical reasons, it's also just a good practice to enable PSPs uh, to meet core requirements of compliance. So our standards like PCI, SOC2, or HIPAA, all of them mandate specific access controls. PCI, for example, if you need to follow that, Article 7 has an access control uh, requirement and help and enabling PSPs and configuring them correctly helps you meet those compliance uh, standards as well. So in essentially to summarize here, PSPs will provide this secure by default constraint that you know, by default Kubernetes is not, but PSPs can help you enable that over and by providing those security capabilities uh, and defining them and grant, and only granting those pods that need those on uh, as on an ad, as a need basis uh, that you know that can be deployed on the cluster. And PSPs will also help you validate the compliance by meeting those requirements of specific compliance uh, frameworks as well. Now, this is how a PSP uh, definition looks like, and you can see here. Uh, specifically, uh, what we have, you know, again, PSP is a cluster level resource, and you can use YAML file, YAML file to define the PSP spec just like you would do for, you know, your other Kubernetes manifest. So here you can see it's a it's a, the kind of pod security policy, and you have specific uh, capabilities that are allowed. In particular, this is a very, you know, if you see on the right, this is a very permissive PSP. So you have allowed capabilities like net admin, IPC lock, uh, specific host paths that are allowed. Uh, and mounting those are allowed, and you can attach to the host network uh, as well as run as you know privileged uh, pod as well. Uh, and so this is an example of how you can define uh, this PSP, uh, and these are some of the capabilities that are associated with uh, what a PSP spec looks like uh, that a pod must follow. Now there are many control aspects or policies that you can define in that PSP. So we saw that was the very permissive one, but you can use it. You can use that spec and define it as you wish. Uh, so a lot of times, security teams uh, want to prevent privileged pods. So you can ensure that uh, you know uh, running as privileged is false, so that prevents the privileged pod from ever starting uh, and control that privilege escalation on that pod. So the first strong mechanism to apply there. The next is to able you know only allow access to what it needs. So restricting access to host namespaces, network, and file systems. So what you saw. Uh, with what Alvaro was showing, access to those uh, uh, network namespaces, you know, you you can ensure that you can control that um, with this PSP. You can also restrict what that user or a pod you know can run as. So making sure it's not running as root. Again, showing that example with uh, Alvaro where you can access uh, and get root access. So you can limit that, uh, as well as limiting other parameters like volumes that the pod can access. Uh, ensuring that it has profiles like App Armor or SC Linux enabled. Uh, but all of this can be found in this complete documentation list. So that control list that, that we have linked here uh, has uh, the full list of what, what is a pod security policy, the allowed capabilities, control aspects, how you can authorize this with RBAC, uh, and all of these capabilities are provided here. So now uh, let's talk a little bit about how you can implement uh, PSPs. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier, uh, you know you're implementing PSPs in the uh, via the Kubernetes API as an admissions controller. Now uh, the, the this has several implications. So the, the first thing is that what's good about this is uh, you know if a pod doesn't meet those requirements, uh, the admissions control will reject uh, the pod before it is even scheduled on that cluster. So think about that admissions controller mechanism as a gatekeeper that doesn't allow that pod to even run if it doesn't meet your requirements saying you know what we saw in the previous slide of privileged you know making sure it doesn't run as privileged only read only file system access sc linux app armor all those capabilities you can define it and if it doesn't meet them the pod will not run uh, the bad part is that once you enable psps in your uh, you know in your kubernetes environments now every pod needs to be explicitly allowed it's not really a binary uh, sorry it's not really a middle ground thing where you know some in, some the pods can run with PSP, some cannot. It's a binary thing. So you, after you enable it, every pod needs to be explicitly allowed. Uh, and the ugly part is that, uh, as you can think about, is different pod, different uh, service accounts might require different uh, uh, ability to run uh, specific PSPs, either permissive or restrictive. So how you enable and implement those PSPs, you need to uh, turn on specific RBAC permissions, which can get ugly. So having separate RBAC permissions for different accounts, uh, different service accounts 
can get a little bit cumbersome and difficult to implement correctly. And if you don't do it right, you know, you may give too permissive uh, access, which you know might allow some sort of privilege escalation, or you may just not turn on our back, uh, which essentially doesn't make a lot, a whole lot of sense because you need it as part of your PSP implementation. Uh, and skipping it essentially means you're not really even running PSPs. So that's important uh, important step to get right uh, and ensure that you're safely config, uh, linking those PSPs. Okay, so now time for a demo. Uh, we are keeping the RBAC concepts for the, another demo that we will do later. Now let's focus on the basic concepts or, or of the PSPs. So let me clear my screen. So first, uh, what we should do is we need to enable PSPs in the cluster. Uh, as we already told you, usually to do this in a manual way, you need to edit the Kubernetes API server configuration and include hot security policy as an admission controller. Uh, fortunately, here in Rancher, you can use the Rancher UI to, um, to enable PSP. So let's just see it. So we have here a cluster, quick start, that is managed by Rancher and we can simply go to edit the cluster configuration and inside the cluster configuration, you can find an option to enable the pod security policy support. And we enable this and also we must select one of the default pod security policies to be used as default. And for the moment, there are two PSPs created. So we will choose the restricted one and save the changes and it will take a few moments because it needs to change the cluster configuration, restart the API server, and so on. But after a few seconds, we'll have PSPs enabled. Okay, so for example, we can check, as, I, as we already said, uh, PSPs are just a standard Kubernetes resource. So you can do something like kubectl get PSP, and you get a list of the PSPs that exist in that cluster. They, they are not namespaced, so we have a restricted PSP that is just what we, uh, it was created by, by Rancher when we enable the PSPs in this cluster. Okay, so now let's um, try to deploy a pod that is not privileged. Okay, this is a standard deployment using a pod with one container, one Alpine container, running as user 1000 and requiring not privileges at all. So if we apply this deployment, Okay, it has created a deployment and as this pod is not requiring any privilege, it is running. The existing PSP will allow this pod to run. But now let's try and see what happens if we try to deploy one pod like the one from the previous example, one pod that is requiring the privilege through in the spec and also host speed and host network. Let's try to apply this resource. Okay, as you can see, the resource applies correctly. So um, we have created a deployment, the privilege deploy, and also this deployment has an associated uh, replica set, but you can see in the output that the replica set is not available. There are uh, zero pods right now. So if we check for the pods, we can see that we have the not privileged pod, but not the privileged pod. So let's try to describe this replica set. And we can see that we have an, an event, an error, describing that there was an error creating pods. This pod is forbidden because it is unable to validate any uh, against any pod security policy. It is requiring host speed and host network as well as privilege and we are not allowing it. You can also check the same. If you go to the quick start cluster and the default project on namespace, here under workloads, you can see that our privilege deploy is not able to create a pod and you can also check the error message in here. It is quite clear, okay? So yeah, let's go back to the slides. Okay, so here we have seen a 
basic example using some same defaults that Rancher provides when you enable PSPs in your cluster. But uh, we didn't talk about RBAC, about role-based access control, and we mentioned that it is a critical feature, a critical part when enabled PSPs. Now we will talk about how we associate pods with a specific PSPs. Okay, so one of the major issues or roadblocks that the operations teams usually face when trying to implement PSPs is getting the RBAC correctly. The RBAC is required to associate which PSPs uh, can be used or how we link them with the corresponding runtime pods. So as we already told you, PSPs are a cluster-wide resource. They are not associated with any specific namespace or associated with any specific pod or workload. Or workload. So the PSP itself is just a set of requirements. It's just, it is just a constraint specification. So what uh, must we do in order to use PSPs or in order to link the pods with the corresponding PSPs? Well, the first thing we need to do is after creating the PSP, we need to create a role or a cluster role in case you want to do it cluster-wide, which grants the use access to this PSP. In this slide, you can see an example of a role in a specific namespace, and the rules for this uh, role provide use birth to the resource type pod security policies and to a specific resource name, which is example PSP. So this role provides the usage for a PSP, which name is example PSP. But okay, this is not enough. We have the object, the resource that will be used, that is the PSP. And we have the role or the cluster role that provides the permission to use that PSP. But we still haven't defined the subject, who will be used, uh, who will be allowed to use that PSP. Uh, what is the subject here? Okay, every pod that we create in the cluster uh, has an identity that is associated with a service account. Uh, if you don't specify a service account in the pod spec, then it will use the default service account from the namespace. Um, so what is missing here? We have the role, we have the PSP, we have the service account. We only need to declare a role binding, or again, a cluster role binding, if you want to make it cluster-wide, to associate the role we just created in the previous step with the corresponding pod service account. So in this example, we are creating a role binding in the namespace, and we associate the role, example PSP role, we just created, with the subject uh, which is the service account web frontend SA inside the uh, web frontend namespace. Okay, I hope you get the idea. In this diagram, you can see the relation between all the Kubernetes resources that are related with PSP. So the idea to summarize is the pod executes, let me use here a pointer. The pod executes with an identity, which is the service account. But in order to be allowed to be created, uh, this service account needs permission to use a PSP. Uh, the role provides the permission they can use birth for the PSP. But then you need to bind this role with the corresponding service account by defining a role binding, which allows the service account to use this role, which provides use permission for the PSP. Okay, so. There is another thing is uh, the same service account can actually match multiple PSPs, but we will talk about that later and ha see how it resolves. Okay, so it seems complicated, but we expect that after this webinar and after these demos, it will be easier for you. Okay, so time for another demo. In the previous one, we forgot about RBAC, and now we are going to see what happens and how we define the, the RBAC. Okay, so instead of using the default namespace that was managed by Rancher, we are going to use a different namespace. We are going to use the PSP test namespace. So let's check our uh, good friend, the not privileged deployment with uh, the non privileged pod Alpine. Okay, and let's try to, um, let's try to deploy this, but using the PSP test namespace, okay? In the previous demo, this worked, there were no problems, but now 
if we check, uh, sorry, if we check the replica set, we can see there is a problem with this replica set. In fact, if we describe the replica set, we can see that, that this pod that is not privileged is not able to create because it's unable to validate against any pod security policy. Okay, uh, what is happening here? Why did it work previously? Okay, as we will learn later, namespaces that are managed under a rancher project get some role bindings automatically created to make using PSPs easier. But as we have created this main namespace manually, as in any Kubernetes cluster not managed with Rancher, we need to manually create the corresponding roles and role bindings. So let's see what's missing in here and let's get this pod working. We need a role. In this case, we are going to create a cluster role to allow using the restricted PSP policy that Rancher already provided when we enable. And then we are going to create a cluster role binding that is a cluster wide role binding to allow any service account in the system to use this role. So the idea is we are going to allow all service accounts to use uh, the restricted PSP by default. This will allow this will allow us to deploy any pod that requires no, no additional privileges in the um, in the cluster. Uh, let's just a reminder, let's see what the restricted PSP, um, the restricted PSP looks like, okay? And now we are going to apply this cluster role and the corresponding cluster role binding. And if we wait a few seconds, wrong name space, oops. Okay. It is not ready yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this record set to force it to be created again. Okay, and now the replica set is current and ready. So if we get the pods, now we have the not privileged pod running. Okay, now let's try to create again a privileged pod. Okay, this is our old friend, the privileged pod. Let's try to deploy it in the PSP test namespace. And again, it will fail. Uh, same reason we already know. Okay, we check um, there should be the replica set. And then we are having the same error. Okay, no PSPs are able to validate this, uh, this pod. Okay, how can we fix this? Because it is a common scenario that you need to deploy a pod with some privileges, but you don't want to uh, provide cluster-wide uh, PSP um, that can be used by any pod. So what we're going to do is we are going to bind this specific service account and allow it, allow it to use the, um, the privileged PSP. So Rancher already created for you a default PSP that is uh, a quite uh, permissive one. It allows for privilege, it allows for host speed, host network, etc. So we're going to use this one. What we are missing again is the role and the binding. So let's see what we can do. Here we're going to create another cluster role to allow the use of the default PSP that is the privilege or the permissive one. And then we are going to create a role binding only for the PSP test namespace and only bind it to the privilege SA account, which is the service account uh, running the privilege pod. So if we apply this resource, we are creating another cluster role, another role binding. And now, again, uh, I'm going to delete the existing record set, uh, replica set, sorry. And after a few seconds, the replica set is working and we were able to deploy to create the privilege pod. Okay. So you have seen a complete example in here. Uh, and as you can see from the demo, the implementation of PSPs is not straightforward. 
So now let's talk and see some tools that can help you adopting PSPs in your, in your cluster or in production. Okay, the problem is adopting PSPs sometimes can be challenging. Uh, using RBAC, the RBAC permission schema, it's not trivial or obvious at first. Uh, if you don't get it right, if you mess the permissions, you can end up providing permissions to pods uh, that can run privilege or you can forbid uh, forbid some pods from running. So you have to be careful um, with that. Also the problem is that PSPs are enabled cluster-wide as an admission controller. What that means is that if you do the configuration wrong, uh, probably it will break your cluster or it will prevent a new pods from running. Um, you have to be explicit, you have to explicitly allow all service account uh, or otherwise uh, they will be forbidden. So before enabling P PSPs, you need to be careful and plan and design your PSPs before enabling them. Because if you don't do it carefully, you can break your cluster. So the question now here is how do we generate the perfect, the least, least privileged PSP for my workloads? Because if you go too restrictive, then you can find that your pods are even running. If you are too permissive, you say, okay, uh, I will see, circumvent this issue, this problem by creating PSPs that are quite permissive. Then you are missing the point. It makes no sense to use PSPs if you are going to allow everything. So let's see how can we help you. Okay, so CC and Rancher can help you. As we already saw, Rancher provides some out of the box uh, workflow to help you manage PSPs and automate the creation of related RBAC artifacts directly from the UI or from the API. So that is very helpful. And also Cystic Secure is a tool that can help you by automatically generating the least privileged PSP from the workload definition. We are going to see this in a demo, but the idea is that you can validate the policies prior to enforcement. So it's like running a simulation, like doing a dry run before you enable the PSPs, you can test if the pods that you are creating in your cluster could validate against the PSPs that you are defining. So let's see a quick demo of this. Okay, so this is like the UI of CISD Secure. And in here, you, we can find a section where we can create simulations for pod security policies. So the idea in here is I can import an existing YAML for a deployment. We are going to use, or, or example, the deploy not privilege, the one we have used in the demos. So I will import this YAML. And since secure is going to automatically create the least privileged PSP that uh, matches the definition, the specification of these pods. So we can see that it will allow run run as user only from 1000 to 1000. It won't allow running as root and it will only allow secret volumes. Okay, so this is the first part of the tool. Then the second part is when you have the PSP and we will see here when, with an example we made a couple of hours ago. When you have the PSP, you can choose one namespace from the cluster or you can leave it blank and run against all namespaces and you can start a simulation. When you start a simulation, Cystic Secure will capture events from the pod creations in the cluster. And when uh, you try to create a pod that would violate this PSP, it will trigger an event and it will be shown in here. So it tells you the name of the cluster and the, of the pod and the container that could violate this PSP. So this way you can test if your pods comply with your PSPs even before enabling PSPs in the cluster. That is the idea. Uh, okay, so Pavel, I don't know if you wanted to talk about some other features. Yes, absolutely. So what we just saw with what Alvaro was showing was how we can help you automatically generate that PSP and then validate it before you push to production. Uh, but there's a couple other functionalities with Secure that we address across the container lifecycle. So starting with image scanning, we can uh, scan for vulnerabilities and misconfigurations before you even deploy 
uh, onto Kubernetes. So integrating into your Jenkins or any other CI tool, we can block builds from uh, being pushed. As well as if new vulnerabilities come out or new ODATE threats, we can tell you exactly where those vulnerabilities lie, which namespaces and applications. Second thing is compliance. So with uh, compliance, we can assess, assess your uh, Kubernetes master node, your worker nodes, and see if they're compliant uh, based on CI's benchmarks for Kubernetes, as well as uh, CI's benchmarks for Docker. Runtime security, so we talked prevention. This is everything around detection, and we use under the hood uh, open source uh, Falco, which we created and contributed to the CNCF. And Falco allows you to create any detection rules, uh, and we leverage that in Cystic Secure. So you can see how we can create a rule, uh, such as someone spawned a shell in a container, uh, we can detect that, someone you know, stored credentials in a config map versus secrets, we can detect that as well. You can specify uh, as well as take certain actions to stop or pause the container, as well as finally take a capture file, which will take a full dump of all the system calls pre and post event. So when an incident does occur, let's take that example of a terminal shell. We can ex exactly tell you where did that occur uh, and explore and analyze the activity uh, and audit the activity around it. So when that shell in that container happened, we can show you who exec into that pod, so which user or service account exec uh, and logged in, uh, what commands were run, what network connections were made, what file activity happened, all, so basically a full stack across the user executing into a pod from all the way down to all the activity conducted by that. And that's pretty useful and unique because these container might live for a few minutes or hours, but even if, if that container is gone, you have a full audit trail of exactly what happened in that container. Okay. Okay, so back to the slides. Uh, basically, you saw how to create a least privileged container and then run a simulation. But uh, before finishing this presentation, so far we have covered most common concepts about PSPs. And now we'll talk about some advanced details that you might need to take into account when using PSPs in more complex scenarios. So just to mention that uh, the controls you specify in the post security policies have default values. So if you omit the control, you might have an unexpected behavior because of these default uh, values. A couple of examples, you can go to the documentation for uh, the exact details, but for example, if you omit the host ports option, uh, it is forbidden by default. So your pod won't be allowed to use any host port option. But for example, if you omit allow privilege escalation, this option is set to allowed by default to avoid breaking set UID binaries. So uh, you are not being uh, on the safe side if you omit it. Okay, and a couple of more advanced detail. PSPs can be not only validating, but also mutating. So that means that the PSP can modify the spec of your pod uh, after validating it. For example, uh, one of the typical example is if you use the must run as non root option in the PSP, that will add a run as non root option to the spec of your pod. It means that the pod might be accepted, the pod will be created, but then if the pod is trying to run as root user, it will fail to run. Okay, so this might be confusing at first. Also, what happens when multiple PSPs? match a given workload. Okay, this one is easy. Uh, as there are two types of PSPs, validating and mutating, first Kubernetes will try to match any of the existing PSPs that are not mutating, that is that will accept the pod as is, and if it finds one that validates the pod, it will use it. If not, it will try to find one mutating policy that will allow the pod to be created. Uh, for these two groups, in any case, the match is done in alphabetical order. So first we try non-mutating policies in alphabetical order, and then it will try mutating policies in alphabetical order. Also related to the mutation, uh, please notice that PSPs can also embed additional runtime security frameworks uh, by, this, by the controls they can provide. For, so for example, you can enable SE Linux or, or App Armor profiles. So this provides an additional layer of security, but again, this can have an unexpected behavior because the pod can be accepted, but if the pod doesn't meet the profile for SE Linux or App Armor or whatever, it can fail to run. Okay, so now 
now we are done with the advanced details. Paven will do a quick recap and we move to the conclusions and questions. So Paven, up to you. Great. So just to conclude uh, the webinar, what we covered was how you can implement PSPs and how you can safely adopt it into your clusters. Uh, essentially, PSP is a, you know, a pretty strong uh, and powerful mechanism to harden your Kubernetes security by allowing you to define least privilege, uh, access control, uh, and specify uh, so certain capabilities before a pod is even scheduled uh, onto your cluster. And PSPs, again, are pretty flexible and powerful. As you saw, uh, you know, if you link uh, your RBAC permissions correctly, you can define uh, specific controls and have uh, permissive or uh, restrictive PSPs applied to diff different service accounts based on your environment, uh, as well as uh, from a performance standpoint, you know, using the native controls of Kubernetes, such as pod security policies, allows you to scale uh, your security uh, posture effectively without a performance hit. So other security tools uh, in the market typically need to instrument your pods, uh, modify the underlying binaries like run C or libc, which can incur a cost of performance and also create a vendor lock-in. But PSPs, just like Kubernetes, is a native mechanism uh, and allows you to use the open source uh, components uh, effectively in your environment. We understand that PSPs can be daunting at first, and there's a lot of components uh, that we have covered. But hopefully after the session, you have a good idea of how you can safely adopt these PSPs. Uh, in your environment and learned about what you can do to prevent attacks in your, on your clusters, as well as learned about some of the open source, uh, as well as commercial security tools, uh, such as Rancher and Assistic Secure, that can help you uh, in your PSP journey as you uh, start to ramp up uh, your applications on Kubernetes. And finally, as uh, next steps, uh, there is a blog that we pushed out that Matthew mentioned. Uh, which was the part one of getting started with PSPs and uh, using them as a Kubernetes security mechanism. We have part two of that blog uh, that incorporates all of the RBAC uh, mechanisms uh, and links to your service accounts that Alvaro discussed in more detail. This is also going to be part of an, uh, the blog that's coming this week, uh, as well as we have a, another webinar uh, next month uh, that we will talk about uh, around uh, around detection. So this webinar was all around prevention using pod security policies. We'll talk about how you can detect anomalies at runtime using uh, Falco, which is the open source runtime detection engine, uh, and and within rancher within rancher environments. So it's great. So that was our topics for the webinar that we covered. Hope you enjoyed it. And now we'll answer any questions that come up. Awesome. Hey, this is Matthew. Fantastic, guys. Thank you so much for going through all that. There is there is so much here with PSPs, um, and there are a lot of questions as well, um, and we have some time to, to answer them. So let's dive right in. Uh, so let's start. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, so here we go. Um, I guess either of you could answer. So what happens if a pod is matched by several PSPs and one of them allows and the other doesn't? Yeah, uh, I, I think we already mentioned that. Uh, so there is, uh, we go like a few slides back. Uh, really, there are, um, it will be alphabetical order and two groups, okay? So first, uh, it will try to match validating only, not mutating policies, alphabetical order, and if not, uh, mutating policies. So uh, maybe there should be a better sorting, but right now it's alphabetical, okay? So as long as there is one PSP that will match the pod, it will be accepted. Okay, awesome, thank you. All right, here's the next one. Uh, what, and a few people actually asked different versions of this question, but what happens with a pod that is already inside a cluster, you know, once you enable a pod security policy? Yeah, uh, as PSP is an admission controller, a validating admission or mutating admission, if the pod is already running, it won't prevent it to keep running. But uh, as pod is more mostly ephemeral, uh, once the pod is destroyed, for example, because the scheduler expels it from one node or it is it scales up or whatever, 
uh, once it tries to create the pod again, then it will um, go through the PSP admission controller. And in case it doesn't match any PSP, it will fail to be created. So it doesn't prevent, it doesn't stop pods that are already running. I see. And okay. I hope that answers cool. the question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's no, great. Thank you. Um, and, and, you know, attendees, if you're listening and you have more questions, please do ask them while we go through these. Um, okay, here's the next one. From what Kubernetes version are PSPs recommended? Is it any? Does it start at a certain one? Yeah, I think uh, it's a very old feature. Uh, I think it's like from Kubernetes 1.5 or 1.6. So it's been around the around 2017 or December 2016, I think. And it's curious because uh, the Pod Security Policy API is still considered V1 beta 1, so it's not a um, final API version. But however, if you check the documentation, it's not enabled by default, but it is one of the recommended admission controllers to be enabled. So it's it's curious. I mean, it's very old and recommended, but not enabled by default. And probably unless you have a very, very, very old cluster, uh, you have it available. Okay, great, thank you. All right, here's the next one. Um, and we're just gonna have a marathon of questions going. Uh, so anyway, here's the next one. Um, is OPA, and I'm assuming that's Open Policy Agent, going to replace <laughs> PSPs? <laughs> hey, that's a good question. Uh, well, uh, you know, it, uh, probably OPA, Gatekeeper, and PSPs have say, some overlapping, overlapping features. So both work as an admission controllers and so on. But uh, I don't see that happening uh, in the um, in the near future because uh, you know PSPs uh, are available out of the box. You don't need to install anything additional. Probably OPA and Gatekeeper is um, more powerful because it provides other features like you can create complex rules depending on the cluster context and so on. But for example, the GKE uh, CIS benchmark uh, mandates you to use PSPs. So for the moment, I, I think they are here to stay. Maybe they are um, superseded by OPA or Gatekeeper in the future, but um, it's still too soon to say. Interesting. Okay, cool. We might, maybe we'll do an OPA session uh, in, yeah. in the future. <laughs> um, okay, so two questions specifically about Sysdig Secure. Um, and I know we talked just a little bit about it, so maybe you could show us a little bit more. Uh, this question is, uh, what what other container security capabilities does Sysdig Secure offer or provide? Yes, I can take that one. So uh, as we briefly showed in uh, one of the demos, uh, you know, Sysdig Secure not only does the runtime security components, but also provides security capabilities across the container lifecycle. So starting uh, with image scanning, so we can scan your container images for any vulnerabilities or misconfigurations in the pipeline directly, and then uh, fail a build if it doesn't meet the security policies. And your developer directly understands exactly why your builds fail. So vulnerability scanning is typically the first step when people are adopting containers uh, and Kubernetes and thinking about security. Uh, we also integrate with admissions controllers to uh, via validating webhooks to prevent any uh, non-compliant or mis you know uh, image that is not uh, recognized as proper to be deployed or scheduled on the cluster. That's another mechanism. And even uh, if there are new vulnerabilities that come up, we can detect those vulnerabilities in ODA threats and map it back to specific namespaces and applications. So your app team can say this you know Java application on this namespace has five images that are running, and these are the ones that are uh, uh, vulnerable. Uh, and then compliance is something that we cover out of the box with compliance policies and runtime security, uh, where we talked about prevention, which is all, all the capabilities with pod security policies that we help you automatically generate a PSP as well as validate it before you push to production, but also detecting any abnormal events. So any mal malicious events that happen uh, under the hood, we are leveraging our FAPO engine uh, that allows us to collect, you know, detect any system activity uh, based on hooking into the kernel. Uh, and finally, from a response standpoint, incident response and forensics is a big component of what we offer. So 
after a container is gone, oh, you know, if, if an incident is, does occur, we have the ability to capture a full audit trail as well as uh, all the commands and you know, file activity that happened uh, when a malicious incident occurred. So you can show, A, explore exactly what happened uh, and analyze that from a response standpoint, but also provide proof of compliance to auditors uh, of exactly if, you know, whether or did you or did you not violate compliance. So uh, full stack and a, a full lifecycle capabilities, starting from scanning, compliance, runtime, security, and forensics. Fantastic, awesome, thanks, Pavan. Um, the lot, lot offered. Um, so, okay, so another question about Cystic Secure, uh, and this is, is also regarding RKE. So for those who don't know, RKE is Rancher Kubernetes Engine, it's just a Kubernetes installer. Um, so the question is, does Cystic Secure help generate pod security policies in an RKE environment? Yes, absolutely. So we can help you generate, uh, you know, regardless of what Kubernetes uh, flavor you're using, uh, Rancher, OpenShift, any of the other uh, platforms or any of the cloud providers, uh, we uh, provide the same experience, uh, which is to generate, help you generate that PSP. So like Alvaro mentioned, you can you know, provide a deployment YAML, will generate the pod spec for you uh, and help you define that, as well as val validate that a PSP by observing the expected pod behavior by looking at the runtime events. So helping you feel confident about applying that PSP before uh, you push it to production and give you that validation is something that we can do in RKE as well. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, all right, here is the next one. Um, how do you deal with third-party provided PSPs that demand impossible conditions? The, and here he goes on to say, uh, the example I ran into was flannel. It includes a PSP that requires app armor, which many distros don't have. Yeah, so uh, I don't know exactly why Flannel would provide a PSP. Probably, um, I mean, creating PSPs in the cluster uh, doesn't mean that your pods won't be allowed um, unless you specific unless you specifically try to bind your pods to that uh, PSP. So I guess a good practice would be like uh, we create. Um, quite restricted PSP, like the one we saw in this demo. Uh, we make it by default available by, for all pods. And then when you find the pods that require some kind of uh, elevated privileges or special use cases, then you create a PSP and attach it or link it to that pod uh, via the role and the role binding. But for this flannel, uh, I don't know the, the exact use case. I mean, I, I cannot see Mm, how a PSP provided by a third party uh, could prevent something from, from running. Maybe it was partly designed. I don't know if the person who made the question can maybe explain better or give some background on the problem. Okay, cool. I don't know yeah. if you, Robert or Matthew, have any idea or can help it with this? Yeah, that was what I was just about to say. So, um, Kevin, it looks like you asked a question. So, if you want to reach out uh, to me on email, Matthew at Rancher.com or on the Rancher user Slack uh, at Matthew, uh, you can describe a little bit more. Yeah, uh, we can join also the Slack and we will try to help with the question. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, let's jump into the next one. Um, let's see. Okay, here's actually another technical technical question, so might not might not be able to answer uh, here, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway and we'll see what we got. Um, so so uh, the user says, I have a Django deployment where I'm trying to install a SSL certificate for HTTPS redirects. I'm, uh, I'm able to install the cert, but the pod is preventing uh, HTTPS. Could this be an issue linked to PSPs and how could I you know detect it and troubleshoot it? Mm -hmm. I don't think the PSP should prevent from using HTTPS unless uh, there is something related to the um, ports that the pod can use or similar. So I could have to check the exact error. Um, okay, so the question is, if it can be linked to a Rancher PSP. Uh, I don't think so. I, I'm, maybe Matthew, you have a better idea, but uh, as far as I saw, uh, basically 
Rancher provides by default a restricted PSP and, and, very, and a very permissive one, and then you can create your own. But I don't see how that could prevent an HTTPS or prevent any certificate for being, from being used. Right. And I just think but, so. probably it's a, yeah. Right, just taking a quick look at all the control aspects in the PSP, in the uh, in the Kubernetes documentation, I don't immediately see it because these are all configuration related. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, that, you know, maybe that's something that we can take offline and follow up on if yeah. there's a specific thing with. Probably because right now I cannot see an immediate link between yeah. the PSPs and the, the problem this person is suffering. Yeah, okay, yeah, makes sense. That's what I was thinking too. So. Um, again, if you do have a, a, a technical issue that you're facing, definitely reach out to us on the Rancher User Slack or reach, reach out to me through email and I'll do my absolute best to, to uh, reply and um, get um, Pavan and um, Alvaro uh, connected to you. Um, yeah. That is, and that is, oh, go ahead. No, no, yeah, I well, was saying that I'm okay with that. <laughs> Perfect. All right, awesome. Um, that is the last question that I see asked. Um, is there anything else you guys want to leave us with before we wrap up? No, the only thing is that thank you so much for uh, being part of this webinar. We have a follow-up webinar next month to talk about detection. So definitely, if you have time, please join that to learn more about how we do detection in ranch environments. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank Thanks you very much for assisting, and I hope it, it helps you. And now you don't see PSPs like some kind of dark magic, uh, magic and complicated. It should be easy once you get the concept. Yeah, this is a, this is a great this is a great intro, and there's a lot to learn. <laughs> um, and as so many people were asking where I can get the slides and, and where I can get the recording. So um, we mentioned a couple times, but just so everybody knows, this was recorded. And we're going to email out the uh, slides and the recording. We'll also make the registration page that you used into sort of an on-demand page, so you'll be able to get the slides there as well. Um, so don't worry, you'll be able to, you know, we don't want to hide any information, so you'll be able to get get what you need. Um, so look for that in your in your e uh, your email later today. Um, and otherwise, we'll we'll wrap up there. Thank you all so much. Uh, and again, if you are really new to Kubernetes or you're new to Rancher, uh, check out you know our Thursday uh, training this week. Uh, which will go over, you know, core concepts uh, and how to get going with Rancher. Um, and thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Everybody have a great week. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, guys. For you. Thank you.